Thank you very much, uh, Matthias, and thanks also um, to uh, Jan and Rongfeng for the, the introduction and to uh, IMS for the, the, the hospitality and also for the, the sponsors of the uh, Distinguished Lecture uh, Series for their, their support of this. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today is um, joint work uh, with uh, uh, Rudolf Grubel and um, Anton Verkolbinger, um, who's uh, uh, here, uh, that um, the, the whole project sort of began in about 2008, um, but this work's more recent, uh, and uh, a lot of it's contained in uh, a paper that appeared in Annals of Probability, um, the, the first... Uh, uh, what do you call it, the first uh, issue, yes, of Annals of Probability uh, this year. Okay, so um, the, the main characters in what I'm going to be talking about today are uh, binary trees, and um, by a binary tree, uh, just what I mean is uh, a rooted tree where every individual has zero or two children and we can distinguish between the left child and the right child. And as you all probably know, there's a very convenient way of uh, representing such objects as um, sets of finite binary words uh, with certain properties. Um, the the tree-like property is that if... Uh, uh, a word um, is in the tree, then so are all of its prefixes, what we get to, you know, just the, the stuff that comes at the start of the word. So if zero, zero, one's in the tree, then zero, zero is, and zero, and uh, the empty word. Um, and also the, the binarity property is um, there that if we have uh, uh, a leaf, uh, well, not, not necessarily, a leaf, if we have a vertex um, uh, where the word ends with zero, then what we get by replacing that zero by a one is also going to be there. And similarly, if we have a, a, a word uh, that ends with a one, um, then uh, the word that we get by replacing that uh, one by a zero is also going to be there. So that's what gives us binarity. Okay, so Please stop me uh, at any time if anything isn't uh, uh, clear here. And so just a little bit about binary trees. Um, we think, of course, of the empty word as the root of the tree. Um, a binary tree will always have two n plus one vertices um, for some n. Uh, n of plus one of those vertices will be leaves. N, will be, n of them will be interior vertices. And although um, it's important in some of the calculations that sort of lie behind what I'm doing today, uh, it won't be sort of particularly important in anything that I make explicit that the number of binary trees with 2n plus 1 vertices is the, the nth Catalan number. So in 1985, Remy introduced an algorithm that um, generated a, a sequence of binary trees random binary trees, T1, T2, T3, and, and so on, um, so that T1 was the, uh, the only binary tree that has uh, uh, three vertices, and Tn um, is uniformly distributed on the set of binary trees with 2n plus 1 vertices. And essentially what it does is... Um, Grow such tree, you know, it grows such trees, although not um, uh, quite that. There's a little bit of rearrangement that goes along with the, the, the growth process. And so what do I mean by that? Well, here's how the algorithm works. Um, at some stage of the algorithm, uh, we're presented uh, with a, a, a binary tree. And what we do um, to get the tree at the next step of the algorithm is uh, first pick a vertex uniformly at random from the tree. 
And then once we've done that, we sort of take a pair of scissors and we sort of think of the subtree as kind of like a bunch of grapes, you know, sort of hanging down, and we snip it off. We, we snip off the subtree, um, just lay it aside for the moment, and then insert, um, that's what the dash tree is there, um, uh, another copy of uh, this tree that has three vertices, the, the sort of elementary kind of atomic uh, tree. And then we've got to put things back together, and we put things back together in sort of the simplest way that you can imagine. Um, we just reattach the tree that we cut off um, to one of the two leaves of that copy of the three vertex tree um, that we uh, stuck in there. Okay, so there's sort of two possibilities for where we reattach um, the tree that we snipped off. Okay, so the details of the algorithm clear? Okay, I'm not actually um, expecting that you see immediately um, why this will generate uniform binary trees. In fact, you know, the, the fact that this does generate uniform binary trees um, is sort of equivalent in a way to... Uh, the, the fact that the, the, the Catalan numbers have the explicit formula for them that I presented uh, because uh, uh, this sort of suggests a way of um, counting um, the, the, it, the number of uh, uh, binary um, trees uh, which leads to an enumeration by the Catalan numbers. And so that's what I think suggested to Remy this algorithm. Okay, so real trees are going to appear in uh, what we're talking about today. So let me give sort of a quick and brutal um, sort of introduction um, to, uh, to real trees. Um, we saw this uh, last week, particularly um, in uh, Anita Vinter's uh, uh, lecture. She gave an introduction to real trees. Um, one of the nice things about real trees is that there's a whole host of different axiomatic uh, prescriptions for them. Um, the one I give here um, doesn't look at first sight like the one um, that Anita gave, um, which she gave via the, you did it via the four point condition, right? And uh, it won't uh, look like that. And one of the nice things about these things is that they're so rich that they have many different um, axiomatic characterizations. And so if one's got a, a metric space, we have sort of the, the usual notion of a, a, a segment in such an object is the, the image of a, a distance-preserving map um, from a sub-interval of the real line uh, into the metric space. And the, the image of the, the, the endpoints of the, um, the interval in the real line, we call them the, the, the endpoints of the, the, the segment. Uh, in the metric space, and an R tree is just a, 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 a sort of a, a, a tree-like metric space um, that has um, these sort of two properties that we associate with um, trees. Um, I hope everyone can see their trees, um, just ordinary trees with edge lengths, is that between any two points um, we do um, have a segment, we can draw a segment between any two points. Um, as we see, you know, we can always do that. And moreover, if we have um, two segments that intersect um, just at an end point um, for each, that's their only point of intersection, then the union of those two segments is also going to be a segment, right? Which is, uh, we see as true um, for uh, trees um, with, with edge lengths, um, those sort of metric spaces, and so our uh, trees are a sort of a grand generalization of that idea. And in fact, it's true um, that if we do have an R tree, then um, between any two points, there's a, a, a unique segment, also something, of course, we're very familiar with um, from just, uh, you know, ordinary trees with, with edge lengths. Yeah. In the plane? 
here's the segment in the plane. Here's the segment in the plane. Uh, that's not uh, an isometric map from an interval. If we've got an isometry that starts here and starts here, yeah. I'm going to play football with you, you know, if you think that you always have to sort of run on right angles, even I can probably get to the ball faster than you. No, sorry to tease you, Jan. Yeah, sorry to, yeah. Yeah, yeah not homeomorphism, I saw it's very important that it's distance preserving, yes, of course, yeah. So, um... Uh, Marshall um, showed that if we take uh, the Ramey chain and um, uh, of think of this sort of just combinatorial tree as a tree with unit edge lengths, and then at the nth stage, um, rescale each of those edge lengths so instead of having unit length, they have 1 over square root n as their length, um, then that sequence of random real trees will converge in a suitable sense, say in the, the gromov hausdorff sense um, to Aldous's Brownian continuum random tree, which um, again we saw um, various times uh, last week in the, the, the learning session, so I won't um, go through uh, an explanation of what um, that is. I mean, you could just sort of take this in a sense as a definition of what the, 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 the CRT um, is. And then Legal in 1999, of course earlier, um, showed what you can think of as converse of that, um, that uh, the, the real tree, um, Aldous's continuum random tree, um, has a, a natural um, mass measure on it um, that assigns all of its mass to the leaves, um, as it turns out, and that if you um, uh, sample leaves um, according to that mesh measure um, without replacement, well, it doesn't matter whether you do it with or without, yeah, what am I talking about? If you just do it, um, sample leaves IID from the mass measure because the mass measure is diffuse so you won't um, get copies, uh, then uh, as you successively do that, um, the resulting process is, is Ramey's chain. And so uh, what this tells you um, via the Hewitt-Savage law is that um, the, the limit um, Brownian continuum random tree um, generates the tail sigma field of the Ramey chain up to null sets. In particular, the tail sigma field of uh, Ramey's chain is uh, uh, non-trivial. It's got this very rich um, random object uh, living there. So, um, if you condition the Ramey chain on the event um, that the, the rescaled chain um, converges to a, a, a particular real tree T, and of course, you know, I'm being sloppy here, that conditioning, you know, means of course all that we construct a, a regular conditional probability and, uh, you know, everything I say here makes sense for um, almost every T where T's with respect to the distribution of uh, the, the CRT, the Brownian CRT, um, then what this will do um, will produce a Markov chain that has the same um, backward transition probabilities as um, Ramey's chain, um, but uh, unlike Ramey's chain, will have a trivial tail sigma field, right, because we've sort of conditioned on Ramey's chain going to a, a, a particular destination. And so, uh, you know, what we've built here is something like a bridge. Again, we saw um, bridges a lot um, last week, um, but it's a bridge where the final destination is we're not conditioning on taking on a particular state at a particular finite time, but rather on our um, Markov chain um, heading to a, a particular uh, uh, destination um, at uh, time infinity. 
And so we'll call any Markov chain that starts off at the trivial tree um, and has the same backward transition probabilities as Ramey's chain, uh, an infinite Ramey bridge. And uh, the name that we'll give to infinite Ramey bridges with, inf in, uh, with trivial tail sigma fields is that we'll call them extremal. And um, the, reason, uh, the reason for that is that by general theory, any infinite Ramey bridge is a mixture of um, extremal ones. And so these are sort of the, the, the extreme points um, uh, in the, the uh, convex set of uh, uh, infinite Ramey bridge distributions. And so the goal for us today is to understand what all the extremal infinite Ramey bridges are. Okay, before doing that, um, we should actually first understand what those backward transition probabilities are, right? Remember, we've said that an infinite Ramey bridge is something that has the same backward transition probabilities as the Ramey bridge. And so this is how um, the Ramey bridge evolves backwards in time. Um, remember, going forward involved picking a vertex at random. Going backwards in time, we pick a leaf uniformly at random delete that leaf and its sibling. Remember, it always will have a sibling by the binarity condition. And um, then close up the gap if there is one. Um, there'll be a gap if the sibling is an internal vertex rather than a leaf. OK, so let's see how uh, that works. In a picture, um, the black dots, the, the leaf that we've chosen, um, we delete um, it and its sibling. Um, that's going to leave a, a gap there between the bulk of the tree and uh, this little um, pendant subtree there. And we just close up the gap by sliding um, this vertex to join with that vertex, um, as in this picture here. Right? So is the, the backward dynamics clear? OK, let me sort of shift gears for the moment because um, what I want to do is give a, a, a rich collection of um, uh, Ramey bridges um, that come from uh, sort of computer science and uh, analysis of algorithms, um, uh, the so-called um, uh, Patricia trees. Um, but the first, before I get to the Patricia trees, the usual way of introducing them is to first talk about another data structure called radix sort trees. So the idea with radix sort trees is that we want to somehow efficiently store um, a, a bunch of infinite binary words uh, into a tree. And so what we do is that we take uh, um, n infinite binary words, and uh, what we do is um, sort of store them as the, the, the leaves of a tree, which won't be a binary tree anymore, not a binary tree in the sense that I've defined binary trees, um, by making the realization that Z1, if we go far enough out in uh, Z1, in Z1, um, then uh, you know, take a finite prefix of Z1, um, then we go far enough out, that finite prefix um, will be unique. And there'll be you know, a minimum such length of um, prefix where that won't be shared as a prefix for any of the other Zs. OK, so, um, and then we just sort of store that in a tree um, in the obvious way using our sort of encoding of uh, points in trees as uh, binary words finite binary words. So suppose that our um, sequence of inputs, Z1 is 1, 0, 0, then followed by something that we don't care about. Um, Z2 is 0, followed by um, infinitely many binary digits that we don't care about. Z3 is 1, 0, 1, followed by infinitely many binary digits that we don't care about. Then you know, these three prefixes here, 1, 0, 0, 0, and 1, 0, 1, are these unique shortest length prefixes that um, are uniquely 
uh, sort of, you know, no, not define, but sort of uniquely separate, I guess is the, the best word, um, the, our uh, uh, infinite binary sequences, and then we sort of array that in a tree. Okay, and the great thing, uh, you know, one of the great things about this is that if we want to sort these guys, um, then if I just read the, the tree from left to right, the leaves from left to right, um, what I'll do is that the original inputs corresponding to those leaves um, will be in lexicographic order. So I've got a data structure um, that uh, stores the infinite binary words in lexicographic order. And this data structure just has a few uh, uh, important properties. Um, the, the most important for us uh, is that it's permutation invariant. If I uh, input the infinite strings in a different order, um, I get the same radix sort tree. Okay, now, this vertex here that's about degree one, okay, it only has one child, uh, this guy's kind of redundant from this purpose of store, uh, sorting things in lexicographic order. Um, if I expunged it, deleted it, and then slid this subtree up to this position, the resulting tree would still have the property that if I read the leaves from left to right, things would be in lexicographic order. And so this um, observation is the basis of the so-called Patricia algorithm. So let's just write phi for the map um, that um, takes a tree, removes the vertices without degree one and, and closes up the gap so that you end up with a, a, a binary tree. Um, then, sorry, uh, composing the map that gives you a radix sort tree with that um, uh, uh, cleaning up map um, phi gives you this map R bar that we call the, um, the, the, the Patricia map. And so here's the Patricia map for the, the same sequence of uh, infinite binary words that we had on the previous slide. So everything clear with the way that that algorithm works? Okay, so now what happens if we take um, our input random variables, we sort of think of um, inputting um, infinite strings, infinite words, one after the other, and take these guys to be IID. So we think of our um, input data um, that we're going to build a tree for as being IID um, with, of course, some uh, diffuse probability measure on 0, 1 to the infinity because we're not allowed to uh, see the same infinite word twice, so that's why nu has to be um, diffuse. And then uh, uh, we let nu r bar n n be the Patricia tree um, built from the first n plus 1 input um, uh, words. Okay, so with a little bit of effort, you can show that this thing's actually a Markov chain. It's not completely obvious that it's a Markov chain, um, but with uh, a little work, one can show that. And um, once you've convinced yourself that it's a Markov chain, then um, it's not hard to see that this thing's going to be an infinite Ramy bridge because by the, the, the symmetry in the situation, um, essentially uh, this remark uh, here, right, um, that uh, um, the, the way that this thing is going to evolve in time is going to be by this thing of picking a leaf at random, deleting it at its sibling, and then closing up the gap if necessary. And um, moreover, this Markov's chain is going to be extremal um, just because uh, it, uh, because of the Hewitt-Savage 0-1 law. 
right, that the, the tail sigma field of this guy um, is contained in the, the sort of exchangeable sigma field of the, the, the Zs, um, which is uh, trivial, um, uh, you know, almost surely trivial um, by the Hewitt Savage 0 1 law. Okay, sorry that this slide sort of looks um, so busy, um, but it's actually sort of quite simple what's going um, on here. Uh, this is going to be a, a, another example of uh, an extremal. Uh, infinite Ramy bridge, um, where the, the building blocks here are a sequence of pairs un eta n, where un's uniform on zero one, eta n's a Bernoulli random variable um, that takes the value uh, zero with probability one minus p, the value one with probability p, and the uniform guys are independent of the, the Bernoulli guys, then for any n, uh, there's a, uh, a, a unique permutation um, which sorts the, the first n uniform guys um, in increasing order. And so that same permutation we uh, apply to the accompanying eaters. And then we use those eaters uh, to um, uh, make a, a, a tree, a, a, a binary tree. Namely, uh, we have, um, you know, we'll have, here's how this guy will, will look. We'll have the empty set, and then this guy here will be um, uh, epsilon. Uh, uh, n1, and this guy will be epsilon n1 bar, where the bar means, um, uh, well, in this case, this guy was 0, epsilon n1 was 0, so epsilon n1 bar was going to be equal to 1. Okay, and then um, suppose that we have um, epsilon uh, this word here will be then epsilon n1, epsilon n2, and then we have epsilon n1, epsilon n2 bar, and, um, oh, I should have drawn that off to the side, but I think you know what I mean. And we sort of just continue on in this way. So what the, the tree that we build at, at any n is going to look like is that it'll have a, 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 a unique spine going down that consists of epsilon n1, epsilon n1, epsilon n2, epsilon n1, epsilon n2, epsilon n3, and so on, all the way down to epsilon n1, epsilon n, n minus 1, epsilon n, n, and then we just stick in the leaves that we have to stick in um, to make that thing into a binary tree. Okay, so um, as I say that at, at time n, the chain consists, the value of the chain consists of a single path of length n uh, with the leaves attached that have to be there. And um, the way that the process is going to evolve is um, you know, this is the sort of thing that we see at time n. Um, and what we do is just pick a, a, a location um, uniformly in this spine and um, insert a, a, a zig or a zag, you know, one, a zig to the left or a zag to the right um, with respective probabilities 1 minus p and p. Okay, and so at any stage we just have this zigzag path and I think you won't find it hard to convince yourself that the backwards dynamics of this guy is again this thing of pick a leaf uniformly at random, uh, uh, delete it and its sibling and close up the gap. So this guy is again going to be uh, 
an infinite Ramey chain, and it's going to be extremal again by Hewitt Savage. Okay, so now we want to do um, uh, get an understanding of uh, uh, what a general infinite Ramey bridge looks like after we've had these examples to, um, I hope, convince you that you can actually get um, some, some quite sort of different and quite rich um, uh, examples of these things. Um, so let's fix uh, 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 an infinite Ramey bridge. And if I just fix, um, uh, you know, the, the value of this guy um, at uh, time n, and uh, there'll be n plus 1 leaves, label those leaves with 1 up to n plus 1, and now do the following thing. Going backwards in time, uh, first of all, pick the leaf labeled n plus 1, uh, delete it, uh, leaf labeled n plus 2, sorry. Uh, oh, uh, I've, yeah, gone here, going backwards in time from n plus 2 to, to n plus 1, right? So anyway, I can sort of consistently label the leaves in such a way that um, uh, here's the sort of take-home message in going backwards from time n plus 1 to time n. Um, the labeled object, whoops, sorry. The labeled object is transformed at time n plus 1 is transformed in the label object at time n um, by taking the leaf labeled n plus 2 deleting it along with its sibling. If the sibling of the leaf labelled n plus 2 is also a leaf, then their common parent, um, which is now a leaf, is going to be assigned the sibling's label, right? So we can sort of consistently label things so that going backwards in time, uh, the unlabeled object um, is indeed uh, what we want it to be. And so we're going to use this labeling um, along with a projective limit type construction um, to build a, an infinite object that's sort of in some sense binary tree-like um, where the, the leaves are going to be um, labeled by the, the, the positive integers. And in this sort of infinite projective limit object, um, the way that the, the leaves labelled with 1 up to n plus 1 are uh, situated with respect to each other um, is going to be essentially um, Tn infinity tilde, the labelled object um, at time n. And so we will have encoded the whole evolution of Tn infinity tilde um, and hence the whole evolution of Tn infinity itself, the unlabeled guy, um, in a single um, infinite object. So how does that work? So just comes from sort of introducing the idea of most recent common ancestors. And so here we are at the nth step in the chain. Uh, we've got leaves labeled by 1 up to n plus 1. I and J are two labels, and we just identify um, the, the most recent common ancestor of I and J here, right? And that also happens to be the most recent common ancestor of K and L. Okay, and now if you think about the way that this object is going to evolve forwards in time, that relationship is going to ma maintain itself forever afterwards. That the most recent common ancestor for I and J in the um, uh, the, the the tree that we see um, at the let's say the the nth stage where M is bigger than N. Um, is still going to be the re most, recent common most recent common ancestor of K and L 
um, in the, the, the nth tree. Okay, so what that does is um, gives us uh, an equivalence relation on pairs of indices where this pair is equivalent to that pair if at some stage they share the same most, this pair has the same most recent common ancestor as that pair, which is something that will be maintained um, forever after from that point onwards. And that's just sort of what I say um, on this, the first bullet point on this slide here. And um, so uh, what we do um, then uh, is introduce some notation, this angle brackets, as the notation for the equivalence class of the pair um, ij, containing the pair ij. And um, we think of uh, angle brackets ij as being the, the most recent common ancestor of the leaves i and j, and as some kind of interior vertex in some infinite tree-like object, OK? OK, now what we want to do is define um, three different partial orders on these, uh, on the interior vertices plus um, the, the, the leaves. And so uh, the, the sort of idea is, um, I've sort of got it over here. It might be easier to, to point to it here. Here's the most recent common ancestor. I mean, and of course, you know, we're actually dealing with leaves, you know, sitting inside, you know, uh, uh, an expanding family of, of, of trees. Um, but uh, I've just drawn it so that we, you know, have the, the minimal amount of information present um, that we need to understand what's going on. And what we have is, you know, here's the most recent common ancestor of I prime and J prime. Here's the most recent common ancestor of I double prime and J double prime. And to get from this most recent common ancestor to that most recent common ancestor, the first thing that we have to do is head down and to the left. OK, and so we introduce this notation here which says that the most recent common ancestor of I double prime and J double prime is down and to the left of the most recent common ancestor of I prime and J prime. Okay, and so you can sort of see uh, uh, a similar thing up here. Most recent common ancestor of I and J is way up here. The most recent common ancestor of K and L is here. And so angle brackets IJ, um, we have to go down and to the left to get to angle brackets KL. OK, so everyone understand how that partial order is defined? OK. OK, this slide looks almost exactly the same, because it is almost exactly the same. Um, what it's just doing is introducing the dual notion of down and to the right. OK, so um, here's um, the most recent common ancestor of I and J is way up here. The most recent common ancestor of K and L is here. And to get from angle brackets IJ to angle brackets KL, I've got to go down and to the right um, uh, to begin with. OK, and then the third partial order, there's probably some name for it. Um, I don't know. Um, it's a, sort of this uh, combination of these two partial orders in a certain way that we de define a, a certain partial order, uh, a partial order just um, using the, the usual less than sign to be that um, I prime J prime is less than I double prime J double prime if either um, the, the second uh, guy is down and to the left or down and to the right of the, the first guy. And so um, we just 
call this partial ordering um, being below. All right? The first one was below and to the left, the second one was below and to the right, and this one we just call being below. Okay, so we've got this equivalence relation on pairs of labels, these three, um, and then the equivalence classes, and then these partial orders down and to the left, down and to the right, and just down. And they've got a bunch of properties that I don't by any means sort of expect you to, to take in, but I've just sort of recorded a, a bunch of properties, um, how these objects play with each other. Um, for example, here's sort of something that goes on that angle brackets HI is down and to the left <coughs> of angle brackets FG. Angle brackets KL is down and to the right of angle brackets HI, and that implies that angle brackets KL is down and to the left of angle brackets FG, right? There's a sort of a consistency thing um, going on here. And all the rest of these properties are just similarly um, uh, uh, sort of simple statements. And so we now want to think of these, uh, uh, what is it, uh, six properties as being sort of like axioms for an abstract structure, of which the thing that we've just built is kind of the uh, the the the, the main exemplar. And so we use this word, um, a digendritic system, um, on a set, script n cross script n for some non-empty set n, is just anything that satisfies these relations where the, the positive um, uh, natural numbers n are replaced uh, by uh, uh, the set script n. Uh, and tells you there why we came up with um, digendritic. It's just a sort of a way of saying binary tree-like. And it really is binary tree-like because a finite digendritic system, the set case where n is um, uh, script n is uh, a finite set, is just a leaf-labeled binary tree. These things are uh, instantiations of leaf-labeled binary trees. And um, any digendritic system on uh, the, the positive natural numbers um, is just the same thing as a, a, a consistent sequence of leaf label binary trees in the same way that we build a consistent sequence of binary leaf label trees earlier. Okay? Okay, now we want to start sort of introducing some randomness and the sort of symmetries that we've got going on uh, in our story. And so there's sort of a natural nota notion of um, permuting um, the, the, the indices of a, a, a digendritic system um, where, you know, you just permute the labels and then permute uh, the... Uh, the equivalence relation and the three inequalities um, to go along uh, with that permutation, to follow along with that permutation. And we'll say that a random digendritic system is exchangeable. Um, uh, you know, and we've sort of seen uh, this uh, kind of notion last week. Um, if for each permutation sigma of n that um, fixes all but finitely many indices. Um, the, the permuted random digendritic system D sigma has the same distribution as D, right? So the obvious um, definition of exchangeability um, in this setting. And what turns out is, not surprisingly, is that the random digendritic system on N corresponding to the label version of an infinite Ramy bridge is exchangeable. Okay, and on the other hand, uh, if you've got a, a, 
you start with a, an exchangeable random digendritic system, sort of restrict it to um, n plus 1 for each choice of n. Um, you get a, a sequence of growing trees. Um, then that sequence of trees that are getting larger and larger is actually going to be the labeled version of an infinite Ramy bridge. Okay, so we've got um, this complete correspondence between infinite Ramy bridges and random digendritic systems. Okay, but we're interested in the extremal guys, right? These extreme points of the convex set of um, uh, infinite Ramy bridges. And so we'll have the natural notion of an exchangeable random digendritic system being a Godic, um, uh, uh, which we um, saw in Yuji's, uh, uh, you know, sort of similar things in uh, Yuji's talk when he was um, talking about uh, uh, exchangeable arrays, um, which is that uh, the uh, permutation invariant events have probability 0 or 1, and then by general theory what one has is that any exchangeable random digendritic system is a mixture of ergodic exchangeable ones and in this um, uh, uh, correspondence between uh, uh, exchangeable random digendritic systems and infinite Ramy bridges, the ergodic exchangeable random digendritic systems correspond to the extremal infinite Ramy bridges. Okay, so now let's sort of look at uh, a way of, of building digendritic systems which is going to lead to um, a representation of the most general possible um, ergodic exchangeable infinite, <laughs> sorry, ergodic exchangeable random digendritic system which by the correspondence that we'll just have established will lead to the most general possible um, extremal infinite Ramy bridge. Okay, so um, the idea is that um, we start with a complete separable um, R tree, real tree S, and some distinguished point rho of S. And then we define a, a, a partial order on S by saying that X is less than Y, or if I want to speak tech X press equal Y, speaking LaTeX, um, if uh, the, uh, the segment joining rho to X is contained in but is not equal to the segment joining rho to Y. Okay, so here XI, the segment from rho to XI, is contained in but not equal to the segment joining rho to XJ. Um, so um, we have that uh, uh, XI um, is less than um, XJ in this partial order. And of course here it just corresponds to the usual partial order on the unit interval. Yeah. yeah. So, oh, yeah, I mean, there's two ways of defining a partial order, right? You either define less than or equal to. But it's sort of a generalization of the less. Well, it's the same thing, right? It's just that I, uh, I define less than, and then that then leads to a notion of less than or equal to, which means either you're less than or you're equal to, and then you have the, the usual three things which I never remember when I have to teach them, right, what they're called, right, symmetry, or no, asymmetry, transitivity, and x less than or equal to x is reflexivity. reflexivity, yes. Yeah, I always have to sort of write on the back of my hand those things when I, I teach this because I never remember what they're called. Okay, so... Um, <clears throat> And then uh, we have um, a, 
a notion of most recent common ancestor, and we sort of saw this um, several times last week, how this goes, um, that uh, here, uh, uh, the most recent common ancestor of XI and, and XJ is actually um, XI. And um, uh, so this is just sort of how you can get a, a, a partial order and a, a, a wedge, a, 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 a great, what is it, greatest lower bound operation out of um, uh, any uh, real tree with a distinguished point. Okay, then the next step is that we think that we've got a, um, a, a countable subset of our real tree um, S. And we'll suppose that seen from the point of view of this countable subset, um, things look binary. And so that's the case here that, um, you know, by things looking binary, I mean um, that things seem to be uh, arrayed in this kind of way, right, as opposed to something uh, like that, right? We're not allowed to, to have that. And <clears throat> so um, this is a, a statement of um, what we mean by binarity that for any distinct IJK, either this happens, this happens, well, this happens. So the overall R tree S um, need not be binary. It can have things like trifurcations instead of bifurcations. But if all of the X's, whoops, thumbs are too big. Where am I? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, that if um, all of the X's are suitably positioned, then from their point of view, things are, are, are binary. Okay, and then we sort of define an equivalence class in pretty much the obvious way on this um, by saying that um, II, the equivalence class um, uh, containing I, um, the, the pair II, only contains the pair II, it doesn't contain anything else. So the leaves are off by themselves in their own equivalence classes. And then if you've got um, two vertices that um, are uh, two pairs of, two pairs of leaves, um, then uh, those pairs will be equivalent um, if and only if they're uh, the corresponding most recent common ancestors in the tree uh, uh, are equal. Okay, so that's the sort of thing that we've got here, right? If I and J, XI, XJ and XK are positioned like this, then the equivalence classes are I, J and K. Um, as I say, for simplicity, we'll just write I for the equivalence class of the pair II. Um, then IJ and IK um, are the same equivalence class and um, JK is a different equivalence class. And so then if we um, introduce uh, an ordering on um, these equivalence classes in the obvious way <coughs> that um, leaves, you know, I is always below its most recent common ancestor and then, uh, you know, IJ um, will be above JK if when we look um, on our real tree, the most recent common ancestor of um, uh, IJ is here, um, sitting before the most recent common ancestor of J and K, which is here, right? And so this, here I've sort of depicted the, the less than ordering 
um, and we see that we do end up with a, a tree-like story. And the left to right um, uh, way that I've embedded this in the plane doesn't have any meaning yet. Okay, we sort of can't sort of tell that just from looking at the, the R tree here, right? There's obviously no left-right stuff going on there in the, the, the R tree. Okay, and so what we actually have to do is have um, little indicators of what's um, left of, uh, what's left and what's right when it comes to children. And <clears throat> so we suppose further for each pair of leaves i and j, um, we have uh, an object wij, um, which is either um, a guy like that um, or a guy like that. And saying that wij is like this means that i is down and to the left of the most recent common ancestor of i and j, and j is down and to the right of the most recent common ancestor of i and j, and so um, the other way around, um, you know, j here is um, uh, down and to the right of the, uh, their, their most recent common ancestor. Okay, and um, of course, what we have to have is that if we're in a situation like this, then wij has to be the same as wik. Right, so wij is, uh, you know, right. And so it's a fact that there's a unique pair of partial orders down and to the left and down and to the right on these interior vertices such that um, we have this situation um, if and only if this happens, okay? And um, these are the two consistency conditions that will uh, force that to happen. And so the end result is that starting from uh, just an arbitrary real tree and a suitable collection, countable collection of points on that real tree, plus um, these uh, left-right indicators, what we've done is built a, a, a digendritic system. Okay, now the, the trick to building a, a random exchangeable digendritic system is to just randomize all of that and do it in an exchangeable way. And I know I'm running out of time, so let me just uh, sort of quickly go through that. You know, again, you start with a complete separable real tree in a distinguished point row and um, replace the X ends by realizations of uh, 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 a diffuse probability measure mu on S, uh, require that mu is such that this realization uh, preserves the, the binarity thing define the equivalence relation and equivalence classes in the partial order below, um, just as we did in the deterministic case. Then we just have to have um, those uh, 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 indicators of to the left and to the right being produced randomly in an exchangeable way, and that's going to be done um, sort of in the spirit of the Aldous Hoover-Kallenberg theory that um, usually uh, mentioned, it's the same sort of thing that, uh, you know, like Crane was doing, um, that we just have to take these indicators to be produced um, using some extra independent uniform randomness, and then once we've done that, we can use the deterministic construction um, to produce down to the left and down to the right. Whoops. And so the conclusion of this is that this procedure builds an agotic exchangeable random digendritic system and hence an extremal infinite Ramy bridge. Okay, and now I've sort of only told you about a quarter of the story or even less than that in terms of how much work's involved because the sort of remarkable thing is, if one can apply the adjective remarkable to one's own paper, 
papers um, is that uh, just sort of, I think, amazed us is that this is the only game in town. Um, that this is the, um, a complete description of all of the ergodic ran exchangeable random digendritic systems and hence all of the extremal infinite Ramy bridges. And um, this is sort of where the, the connection with Aldous Hoover Kallenberg and the connection with or parallels with graph limits and graphons come in. Okay, and sorry for going a little over time there. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Right. 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 So you. Well, a sort of an arbitrary probability measure on S. Well, that's the, the whole thing. So back in this picture here, so basically the, our measure mu, for exa as an example, would not be allowed to assign any mass to this guy. So in this picture, you know, the, you know if there was sort of, if there was sort of like a, a normalizable Lebesgue measure on this tree, that would not be an admissible um, choice of mu. Yeah, uh, mu has to have this property here that it sort of preserves binarity, that if you sample um, IID from it and then pick any three of those samples, they sit with respect to each other in a binary way. Yeah, that's a, a very good point, though, that I probably didn't emphasize enough. No, because basically um, <clears throat> what we've got here is that kind of if you sort of almost all bridges in the sense of the distribution of the CRT, right, because that's one way of producing bridges, right, is to, um, we know that rescaled, the original Ramey algorithm will converge to um, the, the CRT. So for almost all of those limit points, um, uh, you'll have convergence n to the minus a half times the, the Ramey bridge to uh, a fixed tree, which will be a, a typical realization of the CRT, right? You know, your, your, your chosen realization of the CRT. Okay, but the, the possible limit points are much, much richer than, than that. And in particular, this bridge here is not going to be something that you're going to get by sampling from the CRT. Anything that you get from sampling from the CRT, um, if you look at you know, it will be a tree that will fill out, almost surely it'll be a tree that will sort of fill out, you know, the you look at the first sort of n generations as, well, the first m generations as you've built the nth tree, when n's large enough, the first m generations will have filled out everything, whereas this guy is, is far from doing that. You'd have to rescale differently. You'd have to rescale differently, and so, because this, this theory doesn't, you know, <clears throat> these um, trees converge to the limit object, 
but in a different topology, the, the Dube Martin topology. And the Dube Martin topology is where the connection with graphons comes in. Because the connection with graphons is again this um, sampling idea that usually talked about. If I sample, say, um, five leaves from this guy and then look at the random tree that that produces, right? So sample without replacement, uniformly without replacement, five leaves from this guy, I'll get a, a random tree with five leaves. And the distribution of that random tree will, with five leaves will converge to something as the, the guy goes off to infinity. And so that's the notion of convergence that we have here. It's exactly, gra exactly the right analog of graph limit convergence in this setting. Except in graph limit convergence, you choose just arbitrary vertices of your graph and look at the induced subgraph. Here, you choose arbitrary leaves at random and look at the induced subtree. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so the measure, uh, you know, that's something um, you're not a, a shill in the audience because I cut that out because I didn't have uh, time uh, for that. Well, actually, yeah, maybe just go back to... If I see it correctly, it's just a, you can just point to the picture. The picture here. So, <clears throat> I mean, loosely speaking, what it is is that um, uh, you, you, you sample according to Lebesgue measure on 0, 1, and then, of course, I'm having to be a uh, 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 little loose here. Each sample point has a left or a right associated with it, and those lefts and rights are uh, uh, IID Bernoulli halves. Is the the way that it well, but it, that wouldn't correspond. Oh, oh, yeah, in this picture here, yeah, p and one minus p, yes, yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot.